Today we are concluding our series called Knock Knock, When the Devil's at Your Door. And I want to end this series with words from the Apostle Paul and words from Jesus. So if you have a Bible, you can turn with me to Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and also Mark, the 16th chapter. Ephesians 6 and Mark 16. Today I want to conclude by giving you... um, basically final instructions as to how to handle the attack of the enemy in your life. And uh, if you know anything, the devil is not concerned with a casual Christian. He's concerned with a consumed one, one that is total white hot on fire for the Lord. And uh, we're going to find what the devil doesn't want you to know today. I've titled this, What Demons Don't Want You to Know. If you're taking notes, I want to give you what demons don't want you to know. If they can keep you ignorant to what has been already given to you, then they can keep you under their oppression, and that oppression can turn into possession, and you don't want to be demon-possessed today. Trust me. You don't want. I've dealt with many people who have been oppressed and possessed by the demons and the dark principalities of this world, and you don't want that. And so the way that you don't receive that oppression or possession is by exposing the tactics of the enemy and then equipping your soul to fight whenever you feel attacked. So I'm here to give you uh, ammo and arms and equip you to handle the attack of the enemy. Let's read Ephesians 6.10 as the Apostle Paul uh, is writing to the church at Ephesus in his closing letter. He says, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. There are multiple strategies of the devil, but if you put on the whole armor of God, it will protect you from all of the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. This is the battle not in your head, but above our head. This is a battle that goes well beyond flesh and blood. This is a battle for your soul. This is a battle of the unseen world. This is a battle for things that you can't even see. This is God fighting for you on your behalf on matters that you don't even know about just yet. The the demons and the angels are battling it out for your soul constantly. Unseen world against the powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Mark 16 verses 17 through 20. And then he told them, this is Jesus after he's crucified, after he's resurrected, he comes back, he's like, I forgot to tell you something. Before I go back to the right hand of my father, I need to tell you something. So this is a a resurrected Christ. This is the Christ that has proved his power. So now you can believe everything he said before he died was like, well, is he really going to be resurrected or not? This is after he's been resurrected. So he's got street cred. He's got what the kids call clout. He's got clout. He's got all the followers, all the TikToks, all the Instagrams. Why? Because he has proven that everything he preached about has actually come to pass. And so now these words have extreme power. And what he says is so important that we realize what we're up against. Because the last thing you say is always the most important. Right? Like you don't tell your kids something important at the beginning of the day, you know, and then they forget about it. But you got to tell them right right before they, they need to know it, you know. And then he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone, even those from Johnson County. Come on, somebody. Joko in the house. Anyone, even the Duke fans, everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Remember, this is his, these are his final words on earth after his resurrection. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. Do you want me to know what the full power and potential is of a believer? Would you like to know what miraculous signs should accompany you if you claim the name of Jesus as a believer? This should not be casual. This should not be timid. This should be bold and authoritative. It says, what's the first thing they're going to do? They will cast out demons in my name and they will speak in new languages. They will be 
be able to handle snakes with safety, and if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. This isn't a maybe type of gospel. This isn't a maybe type of commission. This isn't like a try it out, and if it doesn't work, try something different. He's saying with all authority and boldness and confidence, when you lay your hands, they will be healed. When you cast out demons in my name, they will have to flee. You have the authority. So... He says, they will be able to place their hands on the sick and be healed. When the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down. He's like, my job is done here. I need to prop my feet up in this lazy boy recliner. He was taken up to heaven and sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. And the disciples went everywhere, even Johnston County, and preached. And the Lord worked through them, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. Can we pray? Father, thank you for your word. We submit to it today. If you say that we can cast out demons in your name, we'll cast out demons in your name. If you say that we can place hands on the sick and they will receive, they will recover, then we will place hands on the sick and they will be healed. If you say that we should preach the good news and people will believe and be baptized, then we're going to do exactly what the good book says that we should do. And we're not going to apologize. We're not going to be timid. We're not going to be embarrassed. We're not going to just have conversations. We're instead, we are going to be bold, convicted, compelled, and consumed people of the gospel. And we know that the devil doesn't like that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The devil is not concerned with our casual Christianity. If you're a once an eight-week person to church and your Bible has a bunch of dust on it, but you claim the name of Jesus, but haven't done anything for the kingdom of light in a long time, you, you're right where the devil wants you because he is okay with someone being casually Christian. He gets threatened, his knees start shaking, he starts sending demons on your behalf whenever you start really becoming a threat to the kingdom of darkness. And I asked my grandfather, what are you doing? What are you doing, Grandpa? He's 86 years old. He's been in the ministry for a long time. He says, oh, grandson, I'm pushing back darkness for the gospel. In the continent of Africa, we push back darkness. You know? He preaches a lot. He's got a preacher voice permanently. He, he wakes up with a preacher voice. He goes to bed with a preacher voice. He says, I'm pushing back darkness. I said, what are you doing today? He's like, I'm going to the dentist, and I'm pushing back darkness at the dentist. I'm like, you're pushing back darkness at the dentist. Awesome. Hopefully your dentist is saved already so he can understand what you're t talking about, you know? <laughs> Keep in mind, he's 86, and uh, he's rollerblading the other day inside the mall. You know there are mall walkers, you know? He's rollerblading inside the mall. He said, grandson, I'm pushing back darkness in the mall, you know? And he said, but they kicked me out. <laughs> I said, why'd they kick you out of the mall? You know, I'm thinking maybe he did something, you know? He's like, I was rollerblading through Macy's, you know? I was like, you can't rollerblade through Macy's, grandpa. He's like, but guess what, grandson? I said, what? He said, I led the security guard to the Lord that kicked me out. I'm pushing back darkness at the Macy's, in the Macy's. You know? The devil is most scared when you understand that you carry the kingdom of light against the kingdom of darkness. He is most scared when you make an intentional effort to push back on the dark things in your life. When you accept mediocrity, when you accept casual Christianity, when you accept a, a, a kind of casual commitment to the things of the Lord, the devil kind of puts you on a shelf but to not be bothered with. But when you go hard in the paint, when you become passionate about the things of the Lord, when you actually begin to share your faith with your neighbor, with your coworker, when you actually begin to reflect the light that you have received, the devil gets nervous. I want a church that makes the devil nervous. You know, like on Sunday mornings, he probably scans America. And there's probably like hot spots on his map. And, 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 and there's probably a lot of cold spots too. Do you know what I'm saying? You've been to those churches before that are no threat to the enemy whatsoever. It's us four, no more. And as long as the pastor preaches exactly what I want to hear, the devil is not nervous whatsoever. My concern is that we would never become the church that doesn't make the devil nervous. 
that he would be happy with how we're gathered and happy with our casual approach and happy with our infrequent commitment to the things of the Lord. But instead, I want to be a church that is passionate and consistent and consumed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you do that, you, re- you realize that you can make the devil mad. So if you're under attack, it's probably because you're, you're, you're headed in the right direction. Because he doesn't bother things that are not moving his kingdom of darkness backwards. But if you are moving the kingdom of darkness backwards, you will feel the pressure of the enemy. So I've come to deliver you three reminders of things that you already have that you can use against the enemy when he attacks. And if you care to take some notes, they all three start with A just to be um, friendly to those that need it to be uh, illiterate. Alliteration is our friend. And the first thing is this, is I have authority. I have authority. When you came to Jesus, he gave you authority by his blood. You no longer, you no longer have to casually, timidly claim the name of Jesus. But instead, with the name of Jesus comes great authority comes great authority against the the kingdom of darkness, comes great authority over that attack that's on your mind. You have authority, believe it or not. A lot of times we don't exercise this authority and we let the devil kind of walk all over us, kind of consume us, kind of break us down. But when the blood of Jesus came into your life, you were granted authority over the demonic activity, over the kingdom of darkness. You were given light that shines bright into darkness. You don't have to achieve some sort of pastoral status to have the authority that comes through Christ. You don't have to come to me in order to be delivered. You now carry the the power and the authority inside of you to do the delivering. I'm not the Pope. You don't have to pray through me in order to receive deliverance. I will pray with you, but you don't have to pray through me. Because you've been given authority over the enemy. You have authority. So when the devil tries to get you to think sideways, when the devil tries to attack your way of parenting or your thought process, you can say, not today, I have authority. I have authority. I have authority. Here's what I know. Authority over demons, it's already been given. This isn't something that is obtained by your merit. You don't have to try real hard to be authoritative. It's already, it comes included in salvation. When you receive the blood of Jesus, when when you ask for forgiveness of your sins, when you surrender to the authority of the kingship and lordship, when you join the Lord's army, you have that authority. The blood is the badge that allows you to exercise your authority over the demonic activity in your life. It says in Matthew 28, when Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. He's saying, the authority that my dad gave me, I'm giving to you. You can walk around authoritative. You can walk around knowing that you have full authority over the demonic activity in your life. You don't have to be oppressed. You don't have to be possessed because you know the giver of light. You know the giver of light. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If he is with me, I have authority over the enemy. I, I, have you ever been down a, a dark hole in the YouTube spectrum? You started watching a sermon, and then you end up watching something really strange that doesn't have anything to do with the sermon? I got to have a bread of life sermon, and I ended up watching someone making bread. <laughs> it's like the worst. The YouTube dark hole is the worst. Well, I was watching something, and it led me to watching a YouTube clip of a kid getting arrested for impersonating an officer. And he worked for a funeral home, and the funeral director had given him authority to direct traffic during the funerals. Not commissioned by the sheriff's office just to direct the funeral procession. You're you're just a traffic guy, not a traffic cop. You're just a traffic kid, you know? And he's out there trying to prove his legitimacy on the body cam footage to these cops. 
I did this, and my, I call the funeral home director, he'll tell you. And then finally, the cop is fed up. He's tired of it. He said, have you been sworn in? Have you been sworn in? And if so, which office swore you in? Uh, the, uh, 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 uh. And they said, turn around. And they arrested him. They opened up his trunk, and they found jackets and vests and a long rifle, all of this in correlation to their, their, their deputy's office. And what he was doing is he was going around with a fake badge, trying to act like he had authority that had never been granted to him. And many of you, if you do not come under the blood that is the badge that says, I've been sworn in by the presence of God, I've been sworn in by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, then you'll be nothing but a fake cop trying that's just supposed to direct traffic but when you come under real authority you would have known i've been sworn in by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony this badge is not just a plastic woody the deputy badge but instead this is the real deal why because i have authority i've been commissioned by this office and that office is the king of kings and the lord of lords the alpha the omega the beginning and the end the first and the last so i'm not a Paul blurred up in here, mall cop. I got real authority over the d- demonic principalities of this world. Some of you are exercising fake authority. Some of you guys are, are, you know what he got arrested for? He got arrested for impersonating an officer. Some of you are impersonating authority because you have not submitted your whole life under the blood and you're grasping at straws trying to get real authority. And what God is saying, if you submit yourself to me, I will be your father. And when you, wherever you go, I will go before you. I will go behind you. I will go beside you. And the blood is the badge that gives you authority that you've been sworn into the kingdom of God. I have authority. I have authority. I've been given authority. Number two is this, is I have ammunition. I have ammunition. We, when I don't know what to say, I can always use what was said. Pastor, what do I say when the, when the devil attacks me? If you run out of things to say, then start saying what was said. Where is the voice of God written down and accessible for us at all times? In his word. You've, you've been given ammunition against the enemy through scriptures the problem is we've been a distracted culture and it's diminished the value of the word and we've gotten to a place to where on the same device that we swipe right we also use it for our bible well, ain't nobody saying nothing in this church because they're like he's right <laughs> the, the 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 bible is bullets the bible is bullets against the enemy Pow, pow. The Bible is bullets against the enemy. He cannot stand when you use scripture against him. Salvation is the gun. Ammunition is found in God's word. There is no gun that is useful without ammunition. Basic firearm principle. One time I was out in the woods just trying to feed my family, you know. I don't know what you call it. We call it harvesting deer, whatever. I get up to the tree stand. Deer walks out. No bullets in the gun. I called Lee, who's our facilities manager here. I said, dude, you'll never believe this. I got all the way up here, super excited to spend time with the Lord. Deer walks out. No bullets. No bullets. There's actually an ammunition shortage in our country right now. Did you know that? I see guys lined up at, at uh, Bass Pro or Academy Sports. They're, they're lined up there on Monday mornings waiting for that shipment, trying to get themselves some bullets, right? Because without, without any bullets, a gun is useless, you know? And there's a shortage. One of my friends has been looking for 22 uh, uh, caliber ammunition for so long, can't find it anywhere. Can't find it. And because of the pandemic and because of the increase in gun, in gun ownership last year, 7 million new shooters added to the database of gun owners. That's a lot more ammo that you need. And I'm not here to advocate for anything except for in the same way that there's an ammunition shortage in America, there is an ammunition shortage when it comes to knowing God's word at the right time in our country. 
and you are going into a fight with a gun of salvation, but with no bullets of the Bible. So when the devil attacks you, all you got is John 3.16. When the devil attacks you, all you got is Jeremiah 29.11. Nothing wrong with those scriptures, but they don't apply in all scenarios. Because you got a little Instagram Bible verse on your Instagram. You got a little, a little tiny walk with the Lord. And, and, and what happens is the devil comes to attack you and you go to fire off a verse, but you, only, you don't got no bullets. I'm wondering how many times we've been ill prepared for the attack of the enemy simply because we didn't know the verses that we could have used during times of attack. God, speak to me. He already has. God, I need your help right now. He's here to help you. Can I say something very practically? It's going to make me sound like a doomsday prepper. But if you don't stock up ammunition, when you need it, it will be gone. If you don't, the reason ammunition is short right now isn't because there's not enough bullets in, 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 they're everywhere in the homes of America. You open up some dude's garage, that's where they're all at. He's stored it up. And many of us go out to fight the devil with zero ammunition. And he, here, here's a very practical thing. If you're relying on the Bible on your phone, I think it's fine. But your mom can call you while you're reading it. You can get a Twitter notification while you're reading it. You can jump over to, a, to a whatever app you enjoy using while you're reading it. The, and and here's, what I, here's what I will say, too. It, it, it's, under, it's under attack. The Word of God is a weapon. And as they try to uh, suppress the use of weapons, talk about suppression. They will suppress anything on this app store is controlled by Apple or Google. Whoever decides, whoever decides what apps go on this phone is decided by somebody. And so I, I would encourage you to stock up on some paper Bibles. This isn't like me saying, hey, get some buckets of food and everything. The Lord's coming back. But what I'm telling you is one day you might not find that Bible app. One day, one day you'll wish you had a paper Bible. One day you'll have to lift up your mattress and find that paper Bible because they'll have removed the app off the app store and they didn't even have to ask your permission to do it. But nobody steals the paper word of God because it is, and nobody can steal the word of God that is written on my heart. So if you really want to stock up on ammunition, put it down deep into your heart. You got to put it down deep into your soul so that when you need a word, you can say, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I am more than a conqueror. Where does my help come from? I look to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the one that does not slumber, the one that does not sleep. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. I don't know if you have enough ammunition to handle the attack of the enemy. And you have to be people of the word. The scripture, it says it, it, says it very plainly. As, as the Bible is the weapon, it says Hebrews 4.12. It says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than, two, than, than a two-edged sword cutting between the soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. If you want to get to the real you, get to the word. Get to the word. Even Jesus does this, by the way. He's being tempted by the devil in the wilderness three times. This is the one who was the word. The one who was the word and became flesh and dwelt among us. The word recited the word. If Jesus, who is the word, needed to recite the word, how much more do you need to recite the word? Because you ain't the word. If Jesus said it is written three times after being baptized and led into the wilderness, for sure you need to have a couple it is written in your ammo box. You need to have a couple it is written. And I, I, I don't know about you, but scripture memorization has fallen off the map, but there used to be whole classes. There used to be whole, uh, junior Bible quiz is what it was called. We called it JBQ, little, little buzzer and everything. They'd, quote, they'd say a scripture, and you'd have to hit the buzzer and say it, out, say it for memory. But you memorize all that little John music. Oh, they don't want to hear this. They don't want to hear this part. You know every single T-Pain song when it comes on. Oh, y'all don't listen to T-Pain? Yeah, every single Bieber song that comes on, you know it by heart. Luke Combs, you need me to keep going or are you good? <laughs> Dan and Shay sing a song, you definitely know it. You better start memorizing scripture, church. It, is, it ain't no Dan and Shay song going to come and help you. 10,000 hours and 10,000 more. Not going to help you. 
Not going to help you. He ain't going to come to your rescue. Little John ain't going to come to your rescue. He ain't going to come to your rescue. It's not. Could you imagine trying to recite rap lyrics when you're under an attack? You better lose yourself in the music the moment you own it. Never want to let it go. You only get one shot. Do not miss your chance to blow. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. There's no power. There's no authority. It's weak sauce. It makes for fun summertime music, but it makes for a terrible defense mechanism against the enemy. You need ammunition. I cannot tell you how important it is that if you have the gun of salvation, that you have the strength to withstand the attack by memorizing the Bible. He's preaching old school now. Yeah, you're right, because there ain't no no new school weaponry that's going to handle the attack of the enemy. There's no yoga class that's going to get you through it. There's no essential oil that's going to come through. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains the same. I came to preach to someone today. Get back in the Bible. Get back into the word of God. Get back into his promises. Get back into his goodness. Get back into a quiet time. Get back into a prayer closet. Somebody better shout to God. Somebody better declare the word of God over their lives. I will raise my children in the way that they should go and they will not depart from it oh he is a strong tower and the righteous run into him and they are safe i need bullets i need bullets i need bullets you may be seated i need bullets man i need bullets some of you out there with a water gun pew pew ain't gonna work heavy attack needs heavy artillery you think we, we think if we were ever attacked, we just send our just send a little little nine millimeter? No way, bro. We got nuclear weapons up in this mug. We're gonna drop it on you. We're gonna drop it on you. Done. Toast. Ruined. You'll be dead before you hit the floor. I must prepare myself. I must prepare myself with ammunition. Just for those that are Second Amendment advocates, I did make sure that that A was the second A. Two A. Ammunition. Authority, ammunition. I'm like, mm, I don't like that. It's okay. I'm just saying, just for you. The third A is I have amnesty. I have amnesty. Amnesty is a general pardon for offenses, especially political ones, against the government, often granted before conviction or trial. Amnesty is when we pardon someone for offenses before we even put them before a judge. You know you have that? Let me connect the dots for you. Unforgiveness is as detrimental as demon possession. I asked the Lord very clearly. I said, Lord, if I was going to give these people anything that the devil is using, that's not like obvious, like foaming at the mouth or squirming or, you know, someone that's demon possessed, what would it be? And like a lightning bolt to my heart, he said, it's unforgiveness is that the devil functions in unforgiveness and he's totally fine with not exposing the fact that there is an unforgiveness spirit, a spirit of unforgiveness. You might not feel it like a demon, but the Rolodex of your mind right now is going to that person that offended you years ago and you can't even get past it. And when you can't get past an offense, you cannot receive all that God has for you. And so here's, the, here's what the devil will use. The devil will use an offense instead of using a demon. You're waiting for a demonic attack, but your unforgiveness is the very thing the devil is using. So it's not obvious that you're oppressed because you're waiting to be possessed to handle the attack. But unforgiveness is a casual way for the devil to creep into your soul and for him to keep you locked down. It says in 2 Corinthians 2, 9 through 11, remember, this is Paul writing to the church of Corinth, trying to correct them on some of their behavior, which was, which was out of line. He says, I wrote this to you as I did to test you and see if you would fully comply with my instruction. He's having to pastor them from a distance. And so he's writing this letter. And he's giving them tests. He's telling you, you need to do this and you need to do that. And one of those things is to forgive someone. When you forgive this man, I forgive him too. And when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with what? Christ authority for your benefit so that what? Satan will not outsmart us. 
What is the attack of the enemy? What's the smartest thing the devil can do? It's not to send a demon into, into you and you shake and, and, and wiggle and do all those things. The smartest thing Satan can do is to leave built up unforgiveness in your spirit. Even Paul realized this. He says, so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. Paul was familiar with the fact that unforgiveness would generate the devil's oppression over that church's life. Don't believe me? Here's what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, 25 through 27. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. And in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, while you're still unrepentant or unforgiveness. And do not, look at this, give the devil a foothold. So much unforgiveness in your life that the devil doesn't need to send demons to possess you. He just needs to send offenses that you won't forgive. You're on guard for like this weird demoniac, but yet you won't forgive your brother or sister. And I just pray that a spirit of unforgiveness would flow, would, would, of forgiveness would, would cancel the unforgiveness that exists in our culture. It's rampant. It's the reason we can't get along. I'll get popcorn and just go through the comment section on Facebook. And look, the devil loves it when you aim at each other instead of aiming at him. And unforgiveness is the most demonic thing most casual Christians will encounter. You might not ever cast, cast the devil out. You might not ever be involved in witchcraft or the dark arts or, or any of those things. Maybe you do. But the one thing we can all probably relate to that the devil gets a foothold in our lives, myself included, is unforgiveness. And where there is unforgiveness, the devil has a foothold. Paul says that he would not outsmart us, that the devil would not outsmart us. And I think he's outsmarted some of you. I'm fine, I'm covered by the blood. Yet you can't stand being with that person. You can't stand even hearing their name. And when their name is mentioned, you partake in gossip that generates and that populates unforgiveness. That's demonic. You don't have to wait till you're foaming at the mouth. Unforgiveness is a sign that, you are, that the devil has made a foothold in your life. Even Jesus on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them while they were in the act, for they know not what they're doing. Unforgiveness is the poison that is creeping in. And when you don't forgive, it's like drinking poison yourself and expecting the other person to suffer the consequences. It's rampant. It's the one thing that I'd love to cast out of every single believer. Get your heart right. Forgive one another. Love your brother. Stop fighting in the comment section. Stop holding back. Your witness is being ruined by your lack of forgiveness. You're making it harder on me to be a Christian because you won't forgive someone that hurt you. You're making it harder on me to preach the truth because they associate Christianity with you and you have not forgiven them. And when you don't forgive, you allow the enemy a foothold and a foothold becomes a stronghold and a stronghold becomes oppression and oppression becomes possession. And some of you are so obsessed by the person that hurts you you wouldn't even think about forgiving them today. May forgiveness reign. Let me read you a story of someone in our church that recently was set free from the spirit of unforgiveness. I'm so grateful to have this story sent to me in between services. If you are watching this online and you attended our 9 a.m. or our Apex location, I apologize that this came to me between services and I felt like it was an appropriate thing to read. Back in 2019, I made an unexpected decision that shook my family to the core. Before I entered into the freedom and healing session, I was consumed by unforgiveness, discouragement, and anger. 
This attitude stemmed from a situation that I went through with my parents. Despite having the incredible opportunity to play college football with another year of eligibility, I decided my time of being an athlete was complete. After sharing this decision with my family, it seemed that all the positive words and pride that my parents had for me when I were thrown out the window. There were words spoken over me that I soon lost sleep over. I began to define myself by these words as they shaped my outlook on life and my identity. I felt like I was a failure and I would never be enough. I felt that my parents would never love me again. The decision that I had spent lots of time praying over, I now regretted. A decision that was best for me changed the atmosphere of my entire family. After these words were spoken over me, I grew to hate my parents. I could not stand being around them. I was consumed by anger and filled with depression. There were times I felt that I was no longer needed on this earth. If my parents couldn't support me, why be here? I was absolutely miserable. I hated myself and the decision I made simply because of the reaction my parents had. Are you hearing this pattern here? There was a time when I did not want to be around or even communicate with my family. It was a miserable time in my life, and this was before I entered into freedom and healing. When I walked into the freedom and healing session with Pastor Dave, I did not know what I needed broken off of me. But the Lord made it very evident that I needed healing from the situation I experienced in 2019. I needed, I needed word and generational curses broken off of me. And I remember in the session being consumed with anger, clenching my fist, thinking back to that situation. And then I remember what Pastor Dave said. He said, lean back and rest in his arms. I leaned back in my chair and felt the presence of God overwhelm me. I felt overwhelmed by his love. My anger and pain were taken away. And I was healed from the memories and words that had been spoken over me. I felt like such a heavy weight was lifted off my shoulders. I felt so loved and that I could just be who God had created me to be. I did not have to try and gain his love by my actions. I could just rest in his presence knowing that I was fully loved and that he is beyond proud of who I am. Throughout the session, it took me a while to get to the point where I could forgive my family, especially my father. But by the end of the session, I was able to get up to a point of forgiveness and believe the truth. And the truth was that I'm perfect in my father's eyes. And when the session was over, I received a phone call from my father and the Lord gave me an incredible opportunity, timed perfectly to forgive him. After about an hour long conversation, I was not only able to forgive my father, but also share what I had just experienced with him. I'm no longer held captive by bitterness and unforgiveness. I am free. I am free from the hold that held me captive for almost two years, and I am perfectly loved in my father's eyes. I do not need a trophy to make him proud. I can rest in his presence. And that is my story, how Jesus set me free from unforgiveness. Cam, would you stand to your feet just so that we can applaud the effort and the freedom? He loves you. He's proud of you. Come on, would you give God some praise today? Come on, stand to your feet. Thank God for freedom. Thank God for healing. Thank God for, for forgiveness that is in the room tonight, today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you say, Pastor Mike, I've been dealing with unforgiveness. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You're a believer. You have authority. You have ammunition. And now you're giving amnesty. You are forgiving. You are pardoning. You are pardoning the sins of your past. Bitterness and unforgiveness gone in Jesus' name. All over this room, I pray right now that you would have the boldness to have the conversation that you need to have. Forgiveness is flowing in this room right now. Freedom is coming right now to your house right now. You no longer have to hate who you were. You can forgive what they did to you in Jesus' name. Look to Jesus right now. Look to Jesus right now. There's someone in here who hasn't forgiven their mother for something that happened during their teenage years. Forgive them in Jesus' name right now. There's someone who who is struggling in their, in their marriage because there's unforgiveness between spouses over something that happened years ago. I pray that you would reconcile and forgive them in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, we need your forgiveness. 
We need your forgiveness. Would you lift your hands to heaven to receive forgiveness? We receive forgiveness. We receive forgiveness right now. No shame. No bitterness. No regrets. I feel the presence of God in here. He is rushing through this place. He is sweeping through with forgiveness. He is changing bitter hearts and broken hearts to whole hearts and healed hearts. And the devil doesn't like the forgiveness that's coming in this room. The devil cannot stand the demons that are fleeing in Jesus' name. Demon of bitterness be gone right now in Jesus' name. Demon of anger in Jesus' name be gone. Demon of unforgiveness, I cast you out into the pit of hell where you came from by the blood of Jesus in Jesus name all power and authority has been granted to us therefore forgiveness come into this room be free be free be free right now be free would you lift your hands be free right now be free be free be free I apologize to you as your pastor if I've ever done anything that offended you. I apologize as your pastor. Forgive me if there was something I've said or something I've done in intentionally or unintentionally. Forgive me. Don't let an offense grow in your heart. I saw someone at the store this week, hadn't been to church since 2019, and I just casually asked them where they had been and they said you offended me on Easter of 2019 and I haven't been back I had no idea sometimes you're offended and the other person has even no idea and so if there's anything I've done intentionally or unintentionally please forgive me if there's an email I didn't respond to or a text message I didn't respond to or a phone call I didn't return please forgive me and let's walk out of here free and forgiven Maybe there's some other offenses in your life that you need forgiveness from. Father, we need you. Forgive us, Father, for we know not what we do. Healing come. Healing come right now. Freedom come. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, Father.